for all of us. It's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, we have a very special guest, founder of the Fugees, multi-platinum, Grammy award-winning musician, philanthropist, actor, producer, and entrepreneur, Praz Michelle. Praz is here to give an exclusive interview about his recently announced venture, Blackchair. Blackchair was teased in the latest Super Bowl during a uh, Super Bowl commercial. It's definitely stood out from all the other Super Bowl commercials in its tone and focus. But today we're going to learn much more about what Blackchair is, where it's going, what it composes, and why, why Praz needed to create it. We also talk a little bit about his influences in life, and we spend a little bit of time talking about a documentary called Skid Row, where Praz spent a nine days on Skid Row as a homeless person to understand what it means to be homeless in America. It's one of the biggest influences in his life and has kind of propelled him to where he is today. But we'll talk a little bit about that as well as many, many other topics. I hope you enjoy this exclusive long-form interview with Praz Michel. Praz, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat with you. We got a lot to talk about. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> but uh, I think we should start with your latest venture, which is Black Chair. Can right. you tell me a little bit about what is Black Chair? Well, Black Chair is, obviously, it's a digital platform that's going to give the culture and underserved people a voice to be able to tell their stories and help them in various places where they've been marginalized. That's great. And there's a lot of components to it that you're going to... There's a lot of components. Well, you know, and when you're talking about the culture, we try to attack the components that's important and very essential to modern day existence, right? So technology being one of them. You can't go anywhere without your phone. I mean, I've literally, I almost died three times trying to either prevent my phone from falling in the water or falling somewhere in the train. I actually jumped to a train track to retrieve a phone. It's just, when you think about it, it's like, it's just a phone, right? Right. But our lives is on the phone. So you talk about that. Then you talk about healthcare, which is not even just a cultural issue. It's more of a, a American issue, healthcare, mm-hmm. you know? But especially in the black culture, not only can they not afford healthcare, but they can't even get the basic, which is this regular checkup, just to kind of like be aware mm-hmm. of what's going on with themselves, right? Right. So, which is very essential. And then you talk about education, and you talk about entrepreneurship, right? To give people opportunities to be able to make little extra income. And so, Black Church is trying to provide the basic right now. And then eventually, there's verticals to Black Church, right? So, it's going to expand and grow and shipment. It's going to go into who knows, maybe railroad. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> you know? <laughs> New Rockefeller. New Rockefeller. Who yeah. Knows? yeah. So, where did the idea originate from? Where did you start? Where did this notion of creating Black Chair begin? Well, to be honest with you, I've been thinking about, they came in phases, obviously. So we're talking about years of like, like I remember almost over 10 years ago, trying to figure out how can I help resolve the healthcare issue, Mm -hmm. right? And then at some point, kind of like spent a couple of years trying to figure that out. That didn't kind of like go anywhere. And then went into, you know, an app that can kind of like bring everyone together It was called Paired Up. That didn't really go anywhere. And then, you know, I thought about, well, can maybe I create something where the culture can have a place where they can make their stories? Because a lot of studios in Hollywood aren't telling the stories at a capacity that we need it to be told, Mm -hmm. right? Look at a film like Hidden Figure. Great film, Mm -hmm. great story. When I grew up in high school and grade school, you know, I learned about Neil Armstrong being the first Right. American to land on the moon, but no one told us that it was a black woman who actually came with the formula to right. allow him to leave and come back in without actually right. getting hurt, right? right? That's important to know these oh, things, right? Oh, so, absolutely. and there's countless more stories. So I thought about, man, what about create something where I don't want to call it a black Netflix, but a place where you see more of those stories, right? Mm-hmm. And so that didn't really go anywhere. 
But then as time came along, it just kind of like all kind of like molded into this one, what I call beautiful disaster, beautiful <laughs> chaos, right? It was just black church. Right. I love it. I love it. So where, we talk a lot about branding on this marketing podcast. Where did the name come from? Actually, the name came from my team. You know, obviously, it's a, black church is a combination of aperture and black. Mm. Which, you know, aperture means an opening or a hole, whatever. Right. And so, you know, when that name came, it just was like, wow, Blatcher. And the way it was spelled, B-L-A-C-T-U-R-E, was interesting. It, it didn't say black, but it said black. It's kind of like it's saying everything and nothing at the same time, right. which is great, you know. And so it just stuck. And now we suck with it to life. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So I think most people that will be listening to this, they've seen the Super Bowl ad right. along with 100 million other people. Mm. And it was a teaser for Black Chair. And it was obviously also stood out from all the other ads. Right. There were, you know, whether it was Tide or whatever it was. Right. How did the idea come about? And what were you hoping the audience was going to take away from that message? You know, it was interesting because it's like you could go two ways. I mean, obviously Super Bowl is like, I like to call it Tim Pole commercial, how they make tempo movies, right? Like the Avengers coming out and it's kind of like, you just want big and big right. and, 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 and bombs and fires. So the Super Bowl is a place where everything is this big, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of noise. And we were like, well, how big can we get? Who are we going to get? Spielberg, right? Spielberg and James Cameron put together. I mean, what right. do you do, right? But we felt like, let's just go back to the basic, especially when we're talking about an audience who we feel like we're trying to lend them a voice. Mm. And sometimes before you can go out and celebrate and party, you got to get your house in order. And so we felt like simplicity was the way to go. Very simple. Like we're not trying to really make a statement, but we're making a statement at the same time. Right. right? It was just, hey, put this tape over my mouth, take it off because our voice is not going to be heard. The blindfold. The blindfold is not even for the culture. It's for how the culture is being perceived, meaning like they're not being looked at. Mm -hmm. So even though it looks like it's coming from one perspective, there's actually two perspectives going on. One is the culture feel like our voice is not being told mm -hmm. or being heard, right? And then the blindfold is we're not being seen. And then it's like, go where you celebrate it, not tolerate it. So it's not just a message for people outside of the culture. It's really a message for people inside the culture, too, to say, look, you know, one thing I've learned is a lot of people like to complain about things, right? Mm -hmm. You look at what happened with the school shooting down in Florida, right? Right. These students, they accomplished something that no one has, no been, one has right? been able to accomplish yeah. since the inception of the NRA, which is since Thomas Jefferson wrote the Constitution, because part of it is the right to bear arms, right? So ever since then... No one was able to challenge them. Our politicians, our leaders, they all got scared to even go against. Because just because you challenge someone about what you believe is right doesn't mean you're against them. It's just, what can we do to protect our children? And it took our children to stand up for something that none of us were able to do. So I applaud them for that. So the point I'm saying to you is what Black Chew was trying to say it's the same thing for the culture. Listen, stop complaining. Do something about it. We know what happened in the past. It's just what it is. How do we all come together to help rectify the situation? Got it. So you've got a lot going on inside Black Chair. Right. And this is a huge initiative. Yeah. You're one guy. Mm -hmm. You have partners. You have people standing beside you, helping you kind of shepherd this along. I mean, I have a team, you know, obviously working with McKinney, which I have to tell you, God sent. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, just because, you know, it's, it's funny because originally I was going to go with another ad agency. No disrespect to McKinney, but they like, right. I guess they like the Bentley of agency, if you will. Not saying McKinney's not. Right. But when you don't know anything, right, the first thing you think, I want the biggest. And, you know, I went to their offices and it was just like, it was like Disneyland, you know? <laughs> and you know how like sometimes, without me getting too spiritual, but when you're on a journey and you're not quite sure if you're gonna get to your destination, 
But along the way, there's certain things or signs that tells you, I think I'm on the right path. Mm -hmm. I may not know how it's going to end. And it's so interesting because had I gone with the quote unquote big agency, I think Black Trail would probably would have been a failure. Mm. Because very rarely do you find a company that actually understand the philosophy, believe in it, especially when you're talking about a culture gap, right? So it's kind right. of like, it's not like I'm coming in, okay, I'm going to start the next Starbucks, Starbucks, so, right? right? This is something that really talks to a certain culture. And this culture is different from any other culture on this planet. And I like to call this culture, it's almost like the common cold virus, right? Just when you think you have a cure for it, it changes into a different virus. That's why there's thousands of common cold medicine on the shelves, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's so many different, there's no one particular. So when you're talking about the culture, the underserved and the black culture, it shifts so drastically. Right. One minute you think, oh, they like this. And you take somebody like Drake would say, I don't like this. The whole culture will shift with him, right? right. It's just no other culture does that, right? right. <laughs> like you can't go and say, I don't like Rolex, and then all of a sudden no one stopped buying yeah, Rolex. Yeah, yeah. Or I don't like right. Tide, right. right? So I'm gonna wash my clothes with something else, right? <laughs> but this culture is so different. So you have to really understand it. So when I'm sitting here talking with McKinney, you know, it's very interesting because I'm sitting in the boardroom. I'm like, I'm telling you, this is what they're gonna need. This is and you're thinking like they don't get it, and then the head guy comes and says, I got you. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. And that kind of partnership, that's when you look at it, it's not just business, because obviously everything is business, right. but you can tell like they believe in the vision. Mm, right. And so that goes a lot further than getting whoever. Right. So when you say, do I have partnership? That's a form of partnership, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously it's my brainchild and it's, it's I'm like Steve Jobs in his garage got this vision, right? And it's a lot of work, obviously, especially when you're talking about in an era where there's a lot of noises, right? So it's like, how do you go above that noise? And how does it become something compelling where people are gonna care about or be like, oh, I heard this before, he just switched it around a little, right? Mm -hmm. So I think with Blackshear, it's starting to have its own lane. Got it, got it. Well, one of those is, you've talked about as a media platform that's going to launch this summer. Mm. The words you've used are voice and access in terms of how Black Chair is you know, going to help the Black community. Can you expand on that? What do you? Well, I think I started to talk about it in the beginning when I said voice. Voice meaning like, let's forget about people who have zero access. Mm. When I mean access, let's talk about entertainment, for example. Whether you be a filmmaker, producer, actor, you know, trying to get into Hollywood, we saw what happened with the whole Me Too campaign, right? Right. And these women, like what they had to subject themselves to or submit themselves to, to just do something that they love, right? I think people should work based on their capability of able to, you know, deliver what they're supposed to do, right? It shouldn't be nepotism or sexism or whatever it is, right? So now let's cut to black community. If you look at your top five black actors, which I would say Denzel, Kevin Hart, Sam Jackson. Sam Jackson's in every movie. He's in a King Kong movie, dinosaur movie, Avenger movie. He's in everything. He's in, <laughs> and he's been doing it since the 70s. Yeah. Anyway, so Rock and Will Smith, let's say your top five, right? right? Those guys combined have gross so I don't know if you know this, but Sam Jackson, obviously, is the highest gross actor, not black actor, actor, period, who starred in movies. So his movies gross, off, I think, over, it was $2 billion. No other actor comes anywhere near him, right? Yeah. So if you combine all those actors together right now, Rock being super hot, Kevin Hart being super hot, they probably four or five billion together, right? Mm -hmm. Not one of them can go to the studio head and say, you know what, I want to make a movie about Frederick Douglass or Christmas Addis the one who started the Boston Revolution. Not one of them. Now, they probably can't maybe a fight. So they stuck to doing stories that the studios feel like they want to produce and fund. Well, Blackshear or Denzel can say, listen, I'm gonna do Equalizer 3, 
but I'm going to come here and tell a story about this man who negotiated with Thomas Jefferson. Frederick Douglass was doing that. Right. Like, people don't know that. So that's when I talk about access. And then also the next Denzel, the next Spike Lee, the next Antoine Fuqua. So, you know, think of black shirt like a highway or a lane in the highway. So right now we got this highway and we have pop culture, you have everything else. And all black shirt is doing is, is adding an extra lane. That's all it is to just feed the world with the stories and voices of the people who feel, who've been feeling marginalized and been feeling like they can't tell their stories. Right. I like it. It brings back the aperture too, as you were describing, right? right? Opening up right. for other people to exactly. come through that lane. Exactly. I like that. Do you think other media platforms that have historically focused on the black community, have they, do you think they've fallen short in some ways? Well, see, the thing is, we're not focusing on the black community. Mm-hmm. All we're saying is the black community has a voice. So let me give you an example. Mm-hmm. So 1981, there was this little network, started this 24-hour music channel, played videos 24 hours a day, seven days a week, called MTV. You heard of it. Yeah. I won my MTV, right? Mm-hmm. For two years straight, they did not play one black artist for two years. On the second year... We're going on the second year anniversary, right after the second year anniversary. This major CEO executive from CBS Records, which is now Sony Music, went to the head of MTV and said, I have this artist, this great artist, that I want you to play his video. And the head of MTV said no. So the executive from CBS said, if you don't play this artist, I'm going to take away all my artists. And his artists were Bruce Springsteen, (laughs) Billy Joel, Aerosmith, Journey. I mean, you name them, right? Mm -hmm. So finally, MTV said, okay, no problem. You know who that artist was? No idea. Michael Jackson. What? The first black artist to get played on MTV and had to fight. To get in. Mind you, we're not talking about Michael Jackson, never heard of him before. He's already a hit by this time. His last album, Off the Wall, had already sold 14 million copies. (laughs) Oh, it's not laughable, but there's no other thing to react to. Right, think about this, right? <laughs> and you would say to yourself, you would have never guessed Michael Jackson because you figured, obviously MTV would play Michael Jackson. No, it was a fight. Oh. But I say this also to say to you, there's another man named Bob Johnson that started this network called BET, mm-hmm. called Black Entertainment Television. What he did is, it's the same analogy I gave you, he created a lane mm-hmm. to give the culture a voice. Without BET... I can name you five artists that you never heard of before, from Keith Sweat, Jarrell LaVert, Erica Badu, who, what we call black famous. Like, black people know who they are, pop culture don't, but these guys made a living. They were able to create, they were mm-hmm. able to lend their voices, right? Mm-hmm. And take care of their families. But on the flip side of it, if I tell you Will Smith, if I tell you Puffy, Sean Puffy Combs, Jay-Z, Beyonce, they all came through BET before they went on MTV, before the pop culture heard of them. There will be no Justin Bieber without Usher, who started on BET. There'll be no Justin Timberlake without Timberland. Mm -hmm. There'll be no Eminem without Dr. Dre. There wouldn't even be a Mark Wahlberg without BET because Maurice Starr, who started this group called New Edition, who you probably never heard of. I've heard of New Edition. You you're yeah. definitely heard of Bobby Brown. Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Maurice Starr, who started the group, he went and did another group called New Kids on the Block, which Mark Wahlberg was the original member, left, boom, did Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch, rest is history. Right. So you see the importance of BET? Mm-hmm. So it wasn't just because... It's for black people. It was just to give them a voice. Mm -hmm. And then the world can come in, hear our stories, hear our voices. Just like for 75 years straight up to last year, the number one genre worldwide selling music was rock and roll. It didn't take a break. Mm -hmm. 75 years straight, Mm -hmm. it just got dethroned last year by hip hop. Hip hop is now the largest selling genre of music in the world. So when hip hop was created and when it started, it wasn't, this is for black people, only black people can listen to it. By the way, it didn't become number one because only black people listen to it. It became number one because the world listened to it. So black church is saying the same thing. It's for everyone to enjoy it, but now we're focusing on the culture and their voices so people can learn more. And you gotta also remember, 
by able to tell more stories, you get to understand the culture more because there's a divide going on, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people don't understand the culture, don't understand why certain things are done. But when you start to see like hidden figures or even Black Panther, right? Right. So it took us 18 years to get a Black cast superhero movie. That's unacceptable, but guess what? It made over a billion dollars. Mega success. Mega success. They did this thing in China, so this was interesting, like a month ago when it first came out in China, and they start interviewing the people who went to see the movie after the movie and asked them what did they think about the movie. And resoundingly, a lot of them were saying, we didn't know this about the black culture, how beautiful it was and this and all Mm -hmm. that. You see the power of that medium? You just got to put the story out there and if people want to see it, they'll go see it. Just like we put out hip hop, the world decided they want to listen to it. They want to hear the stories. Right. They want to hear about the kid in Brooklyn. They want to hear about the Fugees and the politics. They want to hear about this. Sometimes they might just want to hear Cardi B talk about her stripper life. I don't know. But it's the stories and then the world come and embrace it. That's just what Black True is. Got it. So you're on Marketing Today, the podcast. We address marketers and brands. Mm-hmm. You've got an opportunity right now to tell me how do you think brands need to better understand the black community? And is black chair an opportunity to leverage that? A hundred percent. Because listen, we all know this. I think a lot of brands understand that they have a diversity issue. Mm-hmm. We saw the incident that just happened in Starbucks. Right. And I commend the CEO because he's doing this thing on May 28th where he's shutting down 8,000 Starbucks to do Mm -hmm. a racial bias program to teach all his employees Mm -hmm. about the sensitivity and how to react and how. Mm -hmm. So it's a step forward. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, I think a lot of these companies understand they have diversity issues, understand that they have to address it, Mm -hmm. but it's kind of like they're just throwing money at it. Like they pander into the culture. And people know that. I mean, people can see through it. Come on, man. A black person know when they see a black guy in McDonald commercial, that guy corny. I'm <laughs> not, never going to buy no French fries anymore. You know, you could tell, <laughs> make me don't want to eat burgers no more. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But Blacker, through strategic alliances with these companies, can mm-hmm. sit here and say to them, this is what's going to resonate with the culture. Mm-hmm. I am the culture. Right. Right. And I'm part of the culture. I'm a student of the culture. I'm a teacher of the culture. So who better can tell you about the culture? Not this guy that they go hire some executive that may look like I do, but don't know anything about the culture. Mm -hmm. You just have the same skin color as I do. Think about this. You heard about the controversy with the Pepsi commercial, Kylie Jenner, right? Oh, yeah. Can I ask you a question? (laughs) So after they shot the commercial, let's forget that it went through all the logistics it had to go through for them to go shoot it. Yeah. Because, you know, somebody had to tell the story. They had to write it out. They had to pass it through a bunch of different, Mm -hmm. you know, layers of the company. So let's say it skipped a bunch of different layers that it shouldn't have skipped, right? Right. So you're in a boardroom and you got your first version of this commercial. Mm -hmm. You telling me there's not one Black person to be like, excuse me, sir, president of Pepsi. I don't know, man. Black people ain't going to really like this one right here. (laughs) I mean, are you serious in this modern day world? Yeah. Come on, man. And you see what happened, right? (laughs) Right. Disaster. Yeah. It was horrible. It was horrible. Oh, man. But the point I'm saying to you is, so I think Black Chur, not only just for brands and marketers that want to get into the culture, but it's also important for the culture too. Mm -hmm. Because the culture wants someone that can really represent them the way they need to be represented. Hmm. Not doing these commercials or these ads, like the H&M ad, like, come on. You know, it's just, you hurt your brand like that. Mm -hmm. You know, because you know why you hurt your brand? Because in 2016, the African-American consumption was $1.2, $1.3 trillion. Larger than the GDP of Russia, which is $980 billion. Half the size of UK GDP, which is $2.6 trillion. So 15% of the population here in America consume $1.3 trillion. Those are real numbers. 
And it's not going down. It just keeps going up. So this is why it's important for both sides of the spectrum. No, I agree. I agree. I don't want you to give away, but if you're to give some advice to brands, how would you advise them to connect with the culture? Maybe not even how to do it, but maybe what's the first two steps? Well, I mean, the thing is this. Look, you have to get, you have to partner up with people. And I'm not saying Black Trip is the one, but you have to partner with people who not only really care about the culture, but they really understand the culture. So, look, these brands, they don't have time to be going in the hood, going in the clubs, listening to Drake music in the club, people smoking weed. They ain't got time to do all that. But what you do is, we need to be in an inclusive state of mind, which is, okay, I know what I'm great at, I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm not. Because like I said to you earlier before, the culture isn't just, oh, I see, I'm going to look at some hip hop videos. Oh, I know this is what they like, Chris Styles and all that. Okay, let's just, that's not what it is. Like there's things that are happening in the video that if you're not part of the culture, you're not going to be able to understand or see it. It's about being authentic. That's the era we're in right now. In the last five years, it's about, and we've seen this happen, right? We've seen people take leadership that you're like, whoa, I've never seen this in the history of America. Not because that person was great. It was just because that person spoke from a level of being authentic, right or wrong. We're not talking about what's morally right or wrong. We're talking about being authentic to you. So you have a generation right now, the millennials who are the largest group, they just passed the baby boomers, who they want what's authentic. It has to be real, whatever it is. Because once it's real, then they feel like, okay, now I can make a true decision whether or not I want to include this in my life. That's why if you look at studios, now they're scared to death to have their movies that they know is bad to be reviewed. You remember there was a time, man, 15 years ago, you put a nice trailer, they fooled us. By the time you realize the movie is trash, you already paid $10, right? Word of mouth, don't go see that movie. No one goes to see, right? <laughs> right? Right. Or you see the whole movie in the trailer. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, so I think the advice, by the way, it's just my opinion, right? right. Like, I'm no expert in this. Right? <laughs> but I would say that my advice when you're talking about the brands and marketers, and that's why Black Trick came about, mm -hmm. is to say you need people like us to have a strategic alignment so we can all Right. Prosper better, right? Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Got it. Well, I want to switch gears a little bit. Yes, sir. So you're an entrepreneur, an artist, many things, mm. philanthropist. Mm. What's your personal creative process like? I mean, all of those things are creative, whether you're starting a business or whether you're right. making music. What's your process look like? Well, I would say a lot of it has to do with intuition, mm. inspiration, and being a student. You have to continuously want to learn. Mm -hmm. Even when you're on top, you want to learn because you never know, you can learn something big from the smallest person. So that's my creative process. Um, it comes from that, I, I look at people that I respect, people I, I admire, people who I feel like inspire me. And, and I try to go with what's true to me. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people, they're not honest with themselves. Not only they're not honest, but they're not aware. I mean, Self-awareness, it's a word people don't use, but it's such an incredible word. Self-awareness. Wow. You got to know when to throw that baby out of the bathtub. You just got to know, man. You just got to know this is not it. Or I need to do better. Or this is wrong what I'm doing. You got to be able to know when you're wrong. So those, all of these things... It's what helped me with my creative process. Does it change when you're launching a business versus music? The process doesn't change, mm -hmm. but obviously, you know, the way you create music is not going to be the same thing when you're creating a business. When you're creating music or writing a movie or coming up with a TV idea, it's a little bit untangible because you're talking about creating something that you can't really, even if you write it down, it's a feel more so, right? Like, mm -hmm. like when we did my group, the Fugees, when we our biggest hit record was Killing Me Softly. We didn't create it, but when we decided to, well, I, I advised Lauren Hill to sing it. I thought it was a great record to do. 
Nine people before us tried to do that same record. It didn't work. From Luther Vandross to Whitney Houston, you name them. Mm -hmm. Everyone, Cher, whoever. They all try to remake that record. It just didn't work the way it worked for the Fugees. Now, a lot of it could be the timing. It could be a lot of things, the way we did it. But it's a feeling, right? It's like, it just felt good. I remember when I first heard that record in the car with Lauryn Hill from beginning to end. We just looked at each other like, and she was still scared to sing the record because she thought like, we hip hop. I don't want to sing this record, right. you know? And I just kept pushing, pushing for her to sing it. And it changed our lives, right? Because mm -hmm. it was our biggest hit. And so that's one form of creation, right? Mm -hmm. But now when you're talking about creating business, yes, there's some creativeness that it involves from the name, you know, the colors and all that. But now when you start talking about structuring, that's a whole different ball game. You know, and I'm still in the learning process of it because it gets overwhelming and it's serious because now you got to worry about, okay, I'm not creating a production company, music production company with an LLC, right? right? This is a company now, which means the tax structure is different. You know, you start talking about getting geared up for evaluation and you, you're getting geared up for investments and that has nothing to do with creation. It just has something to do with having a good team and being able to really structure it properly. Right, right. I think you hit on it, which is having a good team. So you talked about learning earlier and the your, I think, personal thirst to just soak it all in. What have you learned from all of your previous endeavors, whether it's the Fugees, your time spent on Skid Row for the documentary that you did, that's helped you craft Blackcher and what it is now? I mean, it's a journey, right? So, you know, as you're going through your life journey, you really think about what your passion really is. You think about... Now, everyone has different goals and different outlooks in life, right? Mm -hmm. I think I come from the class of wanting to do something or have some form of a contribution in the society or in the world. That's me. Mm -hmm. And that obviously, that's that, it's just kind of like the same goes for someone who wants to run for president, right? You could technically say that is the most narcissistic thing ever because why you think you can solve everyone's problem, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So it's kind of like the same thing. So you think you can add to society, like, but that's what I want to do is find a way to give back. Right. And that's what Black Tree is, is kind of like is, is finding a way to give back. And so I don't know how to explain it. You know, it's, it's you wake up one morning, you realize you have a calling. Mm -hmm. Like I always knew I had a calling. And I think music was just a means to a way to get to where I think I really need to be going. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I love music and I've been doing it my whole life. But I always felt like I had something greater to contribute to the world than just making music, mm. you know? Well, it leads me to a question I love to kind of get underneath the skin of the person I'm interviewing. Is there an experience in your life that defines who you've become? There's a lot there. There's so many. From Skid Row, mm -hmm. that was a really, you know, Skid Row kind of like started to make that turn for me when I came out of Skid Row. You know, when you're talking about homelessness and you go in there thinking one thing. One, you have one perception about homelessness. They all, oh, they're all on drugs and they're all lazy and they're all this. Then you go in there and you, and you start to really see the numbers, right? You see only 20% of what you think they are, right? Mm -hmm. So then you say, well, what's the other 80%? Right. That's a large majority, right? Regular folks like you and I just can't maintain shelter, right? But they work, right? but they homeless. They make enough where they can survive to eat. They don't have to be in the streets mm -hmm. panhandling, but they can't do the things that regular folks can do, like right. have a home or buy a home, get a mortgage. And you start to say, whoa. And a lot of them don't have what I call a support system. So meaning that, God forbid something was to happen to me, I go to my lowest, lowest low. I can call my mom, go to Florida, camp out over there. She'll never kick me out, no matter what. Right? Cause that's just so I have a great support system. But then you have people who they don't have families. And then you talk about friends, you know how that is. Friends are friends when it's all good, you're at the Super Bowl, you know, you got the pretzels, you got parties. And that time come when, listen, man, I need help. People disappear, right? I mean, this is a harsh reality, right? So 
I think when I went to Skid Row, and I'm dealing with the reality, right? There's this one incident. So when we were doing Skid Row, we couldn't actually pull out cameras because people didn't want to feel like they're in a fishbowl. So I had a hidden camera on myself through the button of my shirt. So for 10 days, when I was in Skid Row, I couldn't take a shower or anything because I had a camera mounted on me, right? Mm -hmm. I had a van that would follow me with another camera with a lens and whatever. So one of the things I decided to do to try to make income in Skid Row was to panhandle. And I found the busiest intersection and figured, oh, I'm just gonna ask people for money, whatever. And there's this one guy who's coming off the ramp, driving a GT Bentley, and he's focused, he's looking straight ahead. And you know, usually when you say to people, hey, can you help spare some change? Can you help me, whatever? Most people somewhat acknowledge you, whether I don't have anything or get away from me, or they'll give you something, right? But then you have that other that just ignore you, like you just a gnat. That's just kind of like, so in my ear, I had like a earpiece where the people in the van can kind of like talk to me. And the director said to me, Yo, are you listening to what he's listening to? And because he was bopping his head, but I guess the microphone picked up the music more than my human ears could pick up, right? And I said, no, he said, focus. And then I focused, and he was actually playing one of my songs, Radio Not from Fuji's, right? Listen, it was devastating for me because that was the first time I realized in his mind, I'm homeless. But had he known who I was, We'd be talking like, it's kind of like, wow, this is deep, man. Yeah. It, just, it just made me feel a really, I started to really say, I could have been homeless. Yeah. Right? What's the difference between me and that guy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I kind of like know fundamentally what the difference right. is all, but anything can happen. Yeah. Anything can happen. That's an amazing story. It's crazy. So what fuels you? What keeps you going? Just the love to create, the love to execute the love to, you know, when I was making music, I never forget, you know, when people would come up to me years later and be like, man, I know where I was at when I first heard the score. Your music changed my life, you know? And to hear people say that, you know, you hear people say that while you're hot, but to hear it afterwards, because there's no reason mm -hmm. for saying that, you feel like, man, this is, this is bigger than me. Mm -hmm. It's not just about me, you know, it's about how you can affect people's lives and just give someone. Because I remember, you know, it was so funny. I remember the when I was a kid, I was a bad kid in school. My mom came to me one day and, and my mom was super, super, super strict. <laughs> and when I say strict, I'm talking about I couldn't come out the house. If I went to put out the garbage, She'd be like, what took you so long? I'm like, mom, <laughs> I had to walk down the stairs. You know, it's like, yeah. not fast enough. You need, right. to, you need to put out the garbage a little bit quicker than that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was one of those situations, yeah. right? Yeah. But I remember when I was introduced to Bob Marley. But I, like I said, obviously I love Michael Jackson and everything. Michael Jackson, when I first saw Michael Jackson perform on Motown 25, when he did the moonwalk. So I've never heard of Michael Jackson prior to that. So that was my introduction to Michael Jackson. I was blown away. I was just like, man, this is what I want to do. And along then hip hop started to come up, run DMC and everything. But what made me go on a spiritual path, if you will, was Bob Marley. When I started to listen to Bob Marley and his words, it's just, that was when I felt like I had a purpose. Mm. He gave me that inspiration. So that's a kind of like how my life started. And this is an age I've been doing what I'm doing now since I was 13 years old. I met Lauren Hill when she was 11, right? That's when I started the Fuji's. And I've never looked back since. And so I have to tell you, I'm so blessed to be sitting here just because I know my life could have went a different way. You know, I grew up in a church. So I grew up with kids right now who, some of them are locked up, dead, to my church people like, what? The church is supposed to be where you go get saved, not where you go to go into, you know, this other world. So I sit here and I think about how fortunate I am. And so I always think about when I do something to always try to find a way to give back somehow. It's just, it's almost second nature for me. Mm. So that's why this black shirt thing is important to me. Not even so much because obviously to be in a tech 
you know, world is incredible right, right now. Oh, yeah. it's, it's the new, what they call that, gold rush. Right. You know? mm -hmm. But I also feel like it's, it's important for the community. It's important because right now in the community, we don't have any examples of that. Right. So the examples we have, unfortunately, a lot of these kids in this country are not going to get to that point. You know, the examples in the community and the culture is Michael Jordan or LeBron James now or Drake, the rapper, mm -hmm. or you want to be a football player or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. I think black people realize it's great. We had Obama. We're not going to get another Obama. Well, unless prize for 2020. No, I'm good. No. Okay. Okay. Well, no politics. Okay, all right. But you see, so so I think you want people to go more into innovation because that's how our society benefit. Right. By having people come in and just add ideas and take it to a different level. If you stagnate that growth, then progress doesn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. So you want that. You want to encourage that. So this is why I think Black Church is important in that aspect. First and foremost, let's forget about the economics of it. Right. First and foremost, what it's going to do for the culture to get them motivated and say, I don't have to play basketball to get mm -hmm. out of my situation. In third world countries, just so you just to give you a perspective, or emerging worlds, right? right? The way people think about getting out of their situational poverty is to get into politics. Because mm -hmm. when they get into politics, they can still corrupt and all that, right? Mm -hmm. In America, the way these kids think about it, either I throw a ball, dribble the ball, or I rap with a mic in my hand. Mm -hmm. Those are the ways I'm going to get out of the situation I'm in, and it shouldn't be that. Right. Last question for you. Yes, sir. Are there any brands or companies that you follow, you track, you think are interesting, or other people should be taking notice of? Or maybe you could use this opportunity as brands or companies you want to do business with. I think a lot of brands are smart enough to know that they have to be more inclusive, more socially responsible. There's obviously brands that I just love everything about what they do, you know, like Apple. And I don't love Apple the same way everyone does. Like, I'm not that guy that's going to stand on the line and wait for the next iPhone or call my publicist and say, hey, tell them I get an iPhone. Like, I don't really care about all that. I respect Apple or Steve Jobs. I fell in love with Apple before I knew what Apple was going to become. See, when I was in college, we had Apple computers. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about early, late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. So I went to college in 1990, right? So it was Apple. This is so fascinating. So I remember when we used to go into the business center, they would have like three Apples, or four Apple mm -hmm. computers. And it's like 30 IBMs right. or Microsoft, whatever they were yeah. called back then. People will wait. <laughs> Apple will be empty. I'm the only one on Apple. People will wait to use one of those computers. Yeah. They didn't like Apple. But something about Apple I always love. But I remember when Steve Jobs introduced, 2001 I think it was, when he first introduced this little machine <laughs> that you can take. Because I used to fly a lot, right? Mm -hmm. And you would have to carry like 20 CDs to hear one song right. <laughs> from your favorite CD, right? Right, right. It was a burden, right? Yeah. To the point where they was making CD cases and people was carrying them like luggages, right? Right. And then he introduces this machine that you can take all your LPs, cassettes, A tracks, CDs, and consolidate them into this one little machine. <laughs> to me, that was equivalent to Thomas Edison. <laughs> Great. 10,000 right. tries to come up before he came up with light. Yeah, right? yeah. That's what this was equivalent. Cause it was just ingenious, you know. It's just you could tell this is someone who really put some thought into. It wasn't just some quick like. It was genius. So I love Apple because of that. And obviously, there's other brands that I like. You know, I like I love Verizon. I love brands that pushes the envelope. Mm. That think about the consumer, right? And obviously, it's hard because look, these brands. They're in the money making business, right? So right. they can't sit here and try to like think all about social, you know? But I like the ones that try to find a way to incorporate that into their model. Good. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me.
Marketing Today is brought to you by Atomic. Atomic focuses on unleashing the growth potential for clients we serve. Atomic is a strategic consultancy specializing in business, marketing, brand, and innovation. Our singular goal is to help you accelerate your efforts with the right mix of expertise, analysis, and creativity. Check us out at atomic.com. A-T-O-M-C-K dot com. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with writing and editing by Kevin Greeley, social media support by Megan Woods, art and graphic design by Sarah Dell. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love to hear from listeners and you can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes with links to anything we talk about on any episode. You can also search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.